Friday. So uh, you can come talk to me at office hours or I'll answer questions on Friday. Um, but I want to just make a little more progress on this stuff so you can get working on some rigid body problems. Um, and the second and last binder check is coming up. Uh, seems a little early for that, but that's what it says. Then you're on the honor system after that. You should still keep doing homework, in my opinion. Um, okay, so last time we finished talking about um, if I start this. Okay, last time we finished the definitions we needed for rigid body kinetics. And this is in 2D only. And today I'll talk about briefly, sort of intuitively, why that is that this doesn't work for 3D. You need a whole different approach for 3D. Um, so we finished defining mass moment of inertia. We define moments that most of you have seen in statics and all of you have seen in physics one. Um, but it's the tendency of something to you know, the, the load that uh, produces a tendency to rotate. Um, and so now uh, the equations we have for, I think this is about the fourth time I've mentioned this, but equations of motion for 2D rigid body kinetics. Our Newton's second law, and that says add up all the forces acting on the chosen body. That's equal to the mass of the chosen body times the acceleration of the center of mass. And by the way, um, okay, so this is the first one. This is not only true for rigid bodies and particles, this is true for general collections of particles or objects. This is, um, true for any collection of particles. So this is true, this is, of these two equations, this is the only one that's true for putting dynamics. Like so, and you're like, what kind of pudding? Like American pudding or English pudding? You know, doesn't matter, general collection. That's pretty cool, like, um, so uh, for example, well, there's a homework problem that asks about this. Um, what if you had a million marbles floating out in space, okay? And you applied uh, 50 Newton force to one of those marbles, okay? What's the acceleration of the center of mass of that whole collection of marbles, okay? That's governed by F net is equal to MA. And you're like, well, we don't even know about how close they are. They could be miles apart or they could, as soon as you apply that force, bounce off of each other or whatever, it doesn't matter. That's the answer no matter what, okay? It's, that's a surprisingly strong statement we can make about that. Um, and then the second equation of motion is rotational Newton's second law. And that says that add up all the moment vectors about A, that's equal to the mass moment of inertia of the chosen body about A, 
times the angular acceleration vector. That's not true for any A. Uh, only, there's only two possible choices of A. In some cases, there's only one possible val uh, location of A. So A is either Give me one. Center of mass, that's right. Or fixed, right. Uh, in the inertial coordinate system. Um, these equations are only, you know, they only hold for inertial coordinate systems. So I probably could just say coordinate system there. But you can't use these unless until you um, until you represent them in an inertial coordinate system. All of these vectors. All right, so we're going to start using that. I want to say one thing about so why don't these work for why can't we use this approach for three D uh, uh, rigid body kinetics? Uh, the answer is, okay, so I'm going to draw what happens generally in 2D and draw what happens in 3D and show you the difference. Okay, so um, in 2D, let's say that we have a two by four, you know, big board uh, that's moving in space. And I'm going to draw it at two different instants. There's instant, here's instant one, there's instant one. I haven't drawn anything. That would be super. Um, okay, so at instant one, this board is in this position, and our coordinate system is this, with the z-axis pointing out, okay. and at instant two, this board has moved to a new orientation. There's the coordinate system. In two dimensions, uh, all rotations are about the z-axis, right? So the only uh, moment of inertia that matters is about z. Anybody have any questions about that? Does that make sense? Um, and notice that in any orientation of that board, the moment of inertia of that board is the same. Okay, Rotating it doesn't change the mass moment of inertia. Both instants. I A about Z is the same. Okay, so I A is constant in time. Right? Now let's draw what happens in 3D. Um, again, instant one. And instant two. Um, and so I'll do sort of the same thing again. We have this board at instant one, it's in that orientation. And instant two, it's in this orientation. And now I'll draw the coordinate system. There's x, y. 
and just be clear about z. And here's x, y, z. Okay. So at instant one and instant two, um, the mass moment of inertia is about z are the same. But think about the mass moment of inertia about the x-axis. Um, here, if you think of this as like a slender rod, in this case, it's a slender rod, and you calculate that as 1 12th times the mass times the length squared. Here, it's doing like a barrel roll about the x-axis, and you'd have that, you know, that sort of trivial case where I said we never actually use that, but but here the mass moment of inertia would be zero. Okay, you see that it's because of the rotation about the z-axis, the mass moment of inertia about x two, and the same is true about y. Here we have a barrel roll about y, and here we have a tumbling thing in this rod. So the key thing is, but um, Ix and Iy changed. So in general, um, you know, in other words, the mass moment of inertia in 3D changes in time. Okay, so that's a fundamental difference between 2D and 3D. Uh, in 2D, you have this idea of a mass moment of inertia that's constant. In 3D, you don't have that same thing, and so you have to treat it totally differently mathematically, right? Uh, that's just sort of background information. That's not really going to come up in problems in any way. Uh, if we have enough time at the end, I don't think we probably will, but sometimes I do a little section on on how you would approach 3D rigid body problems. And it's sort of cool. Um, mostly it's horrifying to see like how much more complicated it gets to do these calculations in 3D. And because of that, people don't even tend to do 3D rigid body problems using Newton's laws. They tend to do it using an energy minimization kind of approach. Any questions? Okay, so now I'm going to give you a general set of steps that we're going to do. Um, we're going to, I'm going to try to remember to follow in my examples. Um, it's not the only set of steps that'll work, but it'll always make sure you get everything done. So a lot of people like to have a set of steps like this. Okay, so here's a general set of steps for 2D. Rigid body kinetics. Um, so first, ask yourself for the rigid body you're dealing with, does this body have a fixed point? Is there a point on this body that's fixed in your inertial coordinate system? If yes, then that's going to be your about point. That's the about point A. If no, um, the center of mass is the about point. Um, you could do every problem with the about point at the center of mass, even if there's a fixed point. And I'll, I think at some point I'll do an example where you see how it works 
in each of those two cases and you get the same answer, but you'll be adding a lot more time to those kind of problems. So I think you'll definitely prefer to choose the fixed point if you have it. Um, second, now that we've chosen the about point, calculate the mass moment of inertia. Uh, third, draw a free body diagram. And this is required, even if you don't think it's important, then you can stop doing it as soon as this class is over. But uh, anytime you use Newton's laws in this class, you need a free body diagram. Um, fourth, uh, determine all forces and moments. Well, I guess that's sort of part of the free body diagram, but do it mathematically. So um, how many non-zero components are we going to get for our force vectors? Two. Yep. Or you like Peace Pro. <laughs> um, yeah. So this is two components. And how many non-zero moment components are we going to get? One. And why is that? Well, there's probably a lot of answers to that, but because we're only doing 2D problems, okay? If we were doing 3D problems, the answers here would be three and three. Um, and this is where uh, I write out the row, the force, and the moments in a table. Okay, now step five. We're only going to do if um, the about point is the center of mass. is Newton's second law. So F net is equal to mass times the acceleration of the center of mass How many useful equations do we get from this? Two, yep. And then step six, we're always going to do. What do you think that's going to be? Not yet, but that is going to be that is going to be sort of. I'll mention that next. Um, moment. Yep. So rotational Newton's second law. Um, this we're going to do in every problem, no matter what the about point is. So sum of the moments is equal to the mass moment of inertia about A times the angular acceleration. How many useful equations are we going to get out of this? One. And then This you can think of as the constraint equation uh, if needed. 
and you'll calculate the acceleration of um, some point on the body as the acceleration of the point relative to uh, mm, well, just write it like this. So if we're trying to calculate the acceleration at some point that other than the about point, um, watermelon equation and or uh, relative motion equation. You don't have to follow this exact order of steps. If you like to just sort of feel and think your way through, that's fine. But if you follow this set of steps, you'll never forget any forget anything. So that's sort of a plus. Yeah. The acceleration of the center of mass in the case. So if your about point is the center of mass, that means there's no fixed point. We're talking about like things flying through space or whatever. Um, and so if you add up all the forces, that'll let you relate the forces to the acceleration of the center of mass, the acceleration of your about point. Okay. That'll let you calculate center of mass relative to ground. Now we're going to do, oh no, first I'm going to do a few boring examples. We're going to get into some cool examples now. Okay, so first example. So let's say we have a hinge connecting a bar to a wall. And let's say that the length of the bar is two meters. Um, the mass of the bar is 10 kilograms. Um, at the instant shown, This bar is released from rest. What's the acceleration of the point P, the end of the bar? Okay, well, let's just go through the set of steps. Um, does this body have a fixed point? Yes, so the about point is at the hinge. And so now we're going to calculate. Um, the mass moment of inertia at the hinge. Since the hinge isn't the center of mass, we're going to have to use the parallel axis theorem. So this is going to be equal to the mass moment of inertia about the center of mass plus md squared. If you look at the table for mass moments of inertia for a I didn't give a sense of this, so um, you can assume that we're treating this as a slender rod. Um, the formula is 1 12th times the mass times the length squared.
And now we're displacing our about point from the center of mass to where the hinge is. So we're going to add the mass of the bar times d squared. What's d in this case? One, exactly. It's the distance from the center of mass to the about point. So one squared. And uh, let's see, what do we get here? Um, uh, so that's uh, 33 and point three repeating plus 10, right? So, no, no, no. Point three repeating plus 10. So 13.3 repeating. What are the units of mass moment of inertia in SI units? Kilogram meter squared. Um, step three, free body diagram. Okay, so what forces do we have acting? There's a weight force, and we can always treat that as acting at the center of mass. Um, the weight is 10 kilograms times 9.81 meters per second squared, so 98.1 newtons down. Uh, and now the only other forces we're going to get is contact forces. So imagine going around the boundary looking for contact with the surroundings. The only other place is at the hinge. And what kind of loads does a pin joint apply to a connected body? Um, so it's in a moment. No moment. So, um, in two dimensions, a body that's not connected to anything can do three things. It has, uh, it has three degrees of freedom. Okay, it can translate in x and y, okay, or any combination of those, and it can rotate about z. Okay, so it starts with three degrees of freedom, and then the joints take those degrees of freedom away. So forget about everything else. Just this joint. Does this joint restrict? Does it prevent motion along the x-axis? Yes, so there's definitely going to be an x component of force. Does it restrict motion, prevent motion along the y-axis? Yep, and so there's going to be x and y components of force, okay? Does it prevent rotation about the z-axis? No, so there's no couple. And so, um, pin joints uh, produce a vector of unknown force components. Okay, so that's three. Uh, now four, I'm gonna write out this table. We're gonna, each of these forces, uh, we're gonna calculate the row vector, the force vector, and the moment vector. Our about point, we already chose at the fixed point. So this is A. Yep. Uh, then, you know, then there's no dynamics, like calculating the, the acceleration is, uh, you know, there'd be no acceleration. Um, and, you know, so we can have rollers and stuff, and then we have to deal with the kind of loads that, but we can't ever have fixed joints and dynamics, or the dynamics are very boring. If you have a fixed joint, then you're doing statics, you know. Um, okay, so let's first deal with R. Um, what's the row vector? The vector from the about point to where that force is applied? Zero. Force vector is Rx, Ry, cross product. All we care about is the Z component, and you get zero for that. 
And now we'll go to the weight force. What's the row vector? One, zero. The force vector is zero, uh, negative 98.1. And the cross product then is negative 98.1. Does it make sense that that weight force would produce a negative moment? Yeah, it would cause a clockwise rotation, which is negative, so that's right. Step five. Um, if the about point is the center of mass, then you use it. Here, the, the about point is a fixed point, so we're not going to use Newton's second law, at least not yet. Maybe later it'll come up. Step six is rotational Newton's second law. And for that one, we're going to add up all the moments. That's just, you know, zero. Minus 98.1. And that's equal to the mass moment of inertia, 13.3 repeating, times the angular acceleration. And so we can calculate. And it's equal to negative 7.38 uh, radians per second squared. Angular acceleration is really a vector, but in 2D, all of our vectors are all of our uh, any vector that represents a rotational quantity has only a z component. So if you wanted to write this as an angular acceleration vector, it would be 0, 0 negative 7.38. Okay. And now we're to step seven, which is just basically, now we're out of the Newton's laws and just trying to apply what we learned to calculate what we're asked for. Okay, so let's think again about what we're being asked for. Um, so we have a bar like this with a length of two meters, and we're trying to calculate the acceleration of this point here. And any point that's moving on a rigid body that's rotating around a fixed point is in circular motion around that fixed point. The acceleration of P, this is P, is equal to alpha cross R plus omega cross the quantity omega cross R. And now we're just filling in those values. Um, alpha is what we went through all of Newton's laws to calculate. That's zero, zero, negative 7.38. R is the vector from the center of the circular motion to the point we care about. So what's that vector? Two, zero, zero. And what's omega? Zero, that's right. So I, I said at the beginning that we're releasing this from rest. So in that instant, it doesn't have, any, none of the points have any velocity yet, and the body doesn't have any angular velocity. So this is just zero. And now we can put this into the watermelon equation, and we have zero, zero, negative 7.38.
uh, crossed with 200 zero, zero, plus this stuff all goes away because omega is zero. And we get zero, negative 14.76. Zero. Or in other words, acceleration in the negative y direction. Yeah. Uh, does it make sense that that has a bigger magnitude than the acceleration of gravity? That's maybe not a totally obvious fact, but it's it's true, you know. And if this was infinitely long, that would be infinitely fast, you know. You can make this so long that it's faster than the speed of light, which obviously isn't accurate, but for small, slow things like this, it, it works perfectly. Um, Okay, what do you know about the direction of the acceleration of point P? You can't give me a number on it, but um, how would the direction of the acceleration of P change if we said that at this instant it had an angular velocity of something? Let's say that it also had an angular velocity in its direction. Do you have any feel for what that would do to the acceleration? Well, I mean, it would still have this, and now it would have a diff another component, too. It would also have a centripetal acceleration due to that angular velocity. It would be going this way, you know, and so you'd have a negative x component and that negative y component. But the way it would come up is just in the watermelon equation. You just plug in the angular velocity that was given there. Any questions about that? That's right, yeah. Um, yeah, it's sort of weird, but that's, that's the world for you. Um, so now let's do a, do we have time for this? Maybe not all. Um, let's do an example of, this is sort of the other simple example type. Let's imagine that um, we just have this slender rod flying through space. So there's the center of mass. And here's the point P. And at this instant, um, it's flying through the air. Angular velocity of uh, zero, zero, 010. radians per second. And um, the velocity at this instant of the center of mass is 510, let's say, meters per second. Okay, so um, at this instant, the velocity of the center of mass is like that. and it's spinning like this. And we wanna calculate the acceleration of that point P.
Okay, so step one, does this have a fixed point? Nope. No fixed. So the about point is the center of mass. Oh, uh, I didn't give the details about this rod. Uh, let's say the let's say the length is let's say it's the same one, two meters, and let's say the mass is ten kilograms. So second, uh, what's the mass moment of inertia about the center of mass? This time we don't have to use the parallel axis theorem. So 1 12th times 10 times 2 squared. So 3.3 .3 repeating kilogram meters squared. Third is a free body diagram. What forces are acting? Only the weight. Um, and so there's a weight force of 10 kilograms times 9.81, so 98.1 newtons and nothing else. Fourth, we'll calculate the row, force, and moment for all the loads, and that's only the weight. The about point is here at the center of mass. So what's the row vector for the weight? Zero. The force vector is zero, negative 98.1. Cross product is zero. Step five, do we need to use Newton's second law? In this case, we do because there's no fixed point. The about point is the center of mass. So Newton's second law says zero, negative 98. is equal to the mass of the chosen body times the acceleration of the center of mass. And so from this, we can calculate the acceleration of the center of mass as a zero X component and negative 9.81, oh God, it's in free fall. Okay, that's the acceleration of the center of mass. Now, the moment equation says add up all the moments, which are zero in this case. That's equal to the mass moment of inertia times alpha. So alpha is zero. There's nothing slowing down that rotation since we're ignoring air resistance. And so in other words, alpha as a vector is zero, zero, zero. And so now the acceleration of that point P, we can think of this as the acceleration of P relative to ground is equal to the acceleration of P relative to the center of mass plus the acceleration of the center of mass relative to the ground. This one we got from Newton's second law.
This one is circular motion. So uh, the acceleration of P, if the center of mass was fixed, so this is just the pure circular motion about the center of mass, is equal to alpha cross R. That goes away because we calculated that alpha is zero. And then plus omega cross omega cross R. Uh, this problem started by giving us the omega vector, 0, 0, 10. We have 0, 0, 10 crossed with the quantity 0, 0, 10 cross. Now, what's our vector going from the center of this circular motion to the point? 0, negative 1, 0 center of this circular motion, we're assuming that the center of mass is fixed. So we're looking for the vector going from the center of mass to the point we care about. So 0, negative 1, 0. And that gives you 10, uh, positive 100. I think so, yeah. Uh, 0. 100, 0 meters per second squared. So finally, put it all together in the relative motion equation, the acceleration of P relative to ground is the acceleration of P relative to the center of mass. plus the acceleration of the center of mass relative to the ground. And that is 0, Intuitively, how is it possible that this thing is in free fall and that point is has a huge positive acceleration? What's going on there? What? It's spinning, and that's that's the centripetal acceleration that's more than compensating for the downward acceleration of the center of mass. Any questions about that? Okay, so I would recommend at least at the start. Just maybe write out that list of steps and set it next to you as you work through these problems. Maybe, you know, as it starts to, as you start looking at it less, you can skip that. But uh, I think it's a good habit at first. Okay, see you Friday.